I'm Edie Lush. I'm the executive editor of Hub Culture. Very pleased to be here with our partners, Handshake, and allow me to introduce my guests to you today. So really pleased to be here with Alistair Grenfell, President, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and South Asia for IQVIA, as well as George Vredenberg, Chairman, Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. Thanks, gentlemen, for coming along. Thank you, Thanks Edie. How are you? Very well. How are you? Warm. <laughs> Warming up, right? <laughs> Slowly. So I want to set the scene here, first of all. The theme at Davos is collaboration in a fragmented world. How does what you're doing and the message that you're bringing to the people here fit in with that, do you think? Well, Alzheimer's is one of those issues that is affecting everyone around the world. This is not an issue or a problem that can be solved by one sector alone. No one company can do it. No one sector can do it. So it's essential that governments and business and patients and academic researchers work together. So we have to work together or we're never going to solve this issue. Let's just talk about what we're talking about. You mentioned Alzheimer's. We think about brain disease. Um, I want to make sure we get our terms right. Alzheimer's, brain disease, dementia, put into some context. Alistair, do you want me to do it or you can take it? Brain diseases, uh, Alzheimer's is a major cause. And just to put it into context, there's around 44 to 50 million people globally who have this awful disease. And that is completely um, underrepresented and misdiagnosed, mm. particularly in low middle income countries. In Western uh, economies and Western countries, we were getting older. So in the US, it's estimated one in eight people have it. So if we don't get a handle on this awful disease pretty quickly, then it will take over, put a burden on healthcare systems and a burden on families. So, I mean, that's why this is so important and so close to George and my heart. I was gonna say that the dementia is a description of a symptom mm -hmm. uh, that causes a brain problem that causes mm -hmm. you uh, to be unable to uh, undertake activities of daily living. Mm. Alzheimer's is the cause of two thirds to three quarters of mm -hmm. dementia. There are other causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's is the major one. So when I say cooperation in a fragmented world, I want to underscore that word world because <laughs> the vast majority of clinical trials for new therapeutics are actually primarily conducted in the US, Europe, Japan, mm -hmm. and Asia. So why don't we see more clinical trials conducted in other parts of the world, Africa, other parts of South yeah, Asia, for example. I'll take that one. Well, I think the reality is the perception with a, with a continent like Africa is it still suffers from, from communicable diseases, malaria, mm -hmm. TB, and it's true. But by 2030, most deaths in Africa will be caused by non-communicable diseases, heart disease, et cetera. And, de and dementia and Alzheimer's is, is hugely prevalent on that continent. Mm. So the first thing is, is a perception issue. The second um, perception issue, I think, with low middle income countries is clinical research is not easily undertaken in those countries. And I think that's a complete falsehood. I myself was in Africa just before Christmas seeing some of our incredible research sites. Where's, where are those? Uh, we, I was in Nairobi in Kenya and uh, traveled to the countryside in Kenya. I was down in South Africa and mm -hmm. uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And the quality of those trials and quality of those research institutions is as good as anything in Western uh, Europe and in the United States or Japan. I think the third area that we should focus on is the fact that traditionally the life sciences industry, whilst focusing um, with some older medications, hasn't really uh, pushed new medications into some of these countries from an economics perspective. And again, I think that's changing because there's a burgeoning middle class. So at IQB, what we're doing is trying to build healthcare capacity do more trials in low middle income countries, but also help governments understand the value of these new medicines to help and alleviate their populations. So I think in 10 years time, you'll see a much more different picture, but those are the causes today why you see more trials in Western uh, countries and more emerged uh, economies. And what's the case specifically for conducting trials around Alzheimer's or other dementias? Well, uh, uh, Alzheimer's is one of the most prevalent uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So it, it is uh, the largest uh, 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 sort of population that's going to be affected. You mm -hmm. know, in the United States, we have maybe 60, 70 million uh, baby boomers. China is 450, 475 mm -hmm. million baby boomers. And so you begin to see that the population around the world is largely in low and middle income countries. And those countries themselves in the next five to 10 years are going to be aging and having a tremendous impact mm -hmm. geopolitically. China's population is shrinking. India's population is growing. 
it's going to change the geopolitics of the world. And so if you're a country with an aging population, you want to do everything you can to maintain the brain health and cognitive mm -hmm. capacity of your population so your workforce still is large enough to be able to compete globally. Interesting. So tell us about the current Alzheimer's disease landscape in these regions. Well, right now, uh, most of the research is done in high-income countries, white Caucasians. Um, 80 to 90 percent of genetics research in this disease is done in hmm. white Caucasian populations, Europe and the United States. We're working with a couple of genetics companies who say, don't give us any more white Caucasians. <laughs> uh, we, want, we want different populations because hmm. we know, given the prevalence of this disease in low- and middle-income countries, there are going to be different causes and mm -hmm. different potential solutions. Uh, so uh, that's why it's important to actually go where the disease is, which mm. is mostly in low and middle income countries and not white Caucasians. Okay. And what efforts have we seen so far to get clinical trials outside? You've mentioned, you've mentioned a few already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think better is possible. Um, and as George said, look, the reality is if you're doing a clinical trial on a homogenous population, it doesn't work well in low middle income countries, if you've got white Caucasian. So diversity is critical. Let's take Africa. The, the, there are three, the over 65s in Africa represent 3.7% of the population. And that's a really important statistic because it's a very young populace. Alzheimer's, you typically have markers for Alzheimer's 20 years before they present hmm. themselves. So if you can start like to what? do... Like what? What's a marker? So, uh, you know, for example, figuring out through voice recognition or hmm. through blood samples that somebody might be prevalent for this disease, you can then start tracking that earlier on. And if you've got a population as broad as Africa with the genetic diversity, diversity that exists in Africa, um, it presents a huge research opportunity to get ahead of this awful disease. And that's what George and I... it's such a young population. It is, exactly. Uh, and so you can, you can do research on that population, but potentially get those markers, and then put the research in there to then improve diversity, which doesn't just help Africa, by the way, but it helps the well, broader global population. Yeah. Interesting. So what do we need to see to have more clinical trials in, in low- and middle-income countries? What do we need to see from national authorities, for mm -hmm. example? Um, shall I say that? Yep, please. Sorry. <laughs> I've got an answer, but I'd love to hear I'll, go, I'll go first, then you go. So, uh, so I think, look, we've got to learn the lessons from COVID. Okay, so I think number one, um, a very flexible but uh, high quality regulatory regime, point number one. Point number two, we've got to recognize that when we do clinical research, we do it for the global populations and not just the white, Caucasian, et cetera, populations that we referenced. The third thing is we've got to recognize that in many of these low middle income countries, there are amazing physicians, mm. amazing nurses, uh, amazing investigators who want to do clinical trials and can do clinical trials. And as I referenced earlier on, the quality that I see in these countries are as good as anywhere else on the planet. Mm. And then the fourth thing is we have to raise awareness through local populations. I mean, just like HIV AIDS in the 80s and 90s, it had a huge stigma around from a patient population perspective in many low middle income countries. Same thing applies to Alzheimer's today. So we have to educate the patient populace as well. So those are some of the things that I think will help bring trials into those, uh, those countries. George? And I think, uh, I think technology is gonna bring a lower cost, more accessible mm. means of detecting this disease earlier and doing things about it. Uh, today, you need a big PET scan, which is a very large piece of mm -hmm. equipment, very expensive, in order to detect whether you've got uh, the beta amyloid and tau proteins that are today regarded as the signal of this disease. In the future, it'll be blood. Hmm. Uh, right now, you need paper and pencil tests to <laughs> test whether or not yeah. someone's got cognitive Got to draw the clock, right? right. Got to draw the clock, but now you can draw it on a cell phone. Hmm. Uh, and so that is going to enable us to reach... Uh, lower income populations and be much more accessible in determining whether someone's got Alzheimer's or risk of Alzheimer's and therefore we can intervene earlier. And I imagine that the, with the use of AI you can make it can just be happen much faster, right? Uh, AI is going to permit us uh, to basically take less information and discern and make inferences uh, much more effectively mm -hmm. so that we can do this uh, much more less expensively and we can compare and contrast populations around the world to determine the differential impacts of a variety of different causes and risk factors for Alzheimer's. Exposures environmentally are having an impact on this disease. Well, exposures environmentally are different than in Africa and in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna be able to discern these differential factors in different parts of the world. 
But if two thirds to three quarters of this disease is in low and middle income countries, we should be there. As Alistair mm. said, we've got to learn from COVID. We have to start with everybody involved, not with white Caucasians telling the rest of the world what it is the solution should be. So what are the opportunities for the local hospitals, the local organizations, mm -hmm. uh, universities in these regions of the world mm -hmm. to get involved in what you're doing? Yeah, so I've, first of all, if you go to these regions, I'll say it again, the quality of healthcare from a research perspective is fantastic, mm. point number one. Point number two, they want to do more clinical research, more clinical trials, because clinical trials isn't just a testing environment, it's a treatment environment. We also have to do a better job as a global industry of when we set these recruitment sites up, we keep them live. So in other words, when the clinical trial is finished, we don't just then close the site down, mm -hmm. we carry on. And I'll go back to what I said beforehand about Africa, for example. 2030, more deaths will occur in Africa through non-communicable diseases than infectious diseases. So it makes sense as well for these local countries to build up their own infrastructure to do the trials today for the future trials for tomorrow. And that's what our, we're trying to do here at IQVIA and also in partnership mm -hmm. with George to bring awareness here, but also through our life science clients to, to demonstrate to them what a great recruitment uh, area and countries there are in LMICs. And to Alistair's point, one of the risk factors or two of the risk factors for Alzheimer's are cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. diabetes. And so these health centers around the world are skilled in those non-communicable diseases, mm -hmm. but those are also risk factors for Alzheimer's. So that if in fact you begin to turn all the skills that Alistair described uh, onto this and explain and, uh, and begin to test the relationship between solving some cardiovascular and diabetic problems, mm. uh, you can begin to get risk factors for Alzheimer's. So there's the, the body is a unity. We tend to discover this by disease by disease mm. or organ by mm. organ. In fact, the brain is central to all of this. Mm. And so we've got to begin to link what happened in the brain to the rest of the body. A checkup from the neck up ought to be as common and routine as a checkup from the neck down. Uh, and so we need to be able to develop the skill sets that Alistair describes out there and turn them into, let's connect this to the brain. What are the lessons that we can learn, for example, from COVID-19, HIV, AIDS that might be appropriate to apply to, to Alzheimer's and brain mm -hmm. health? Um, there were so many lessons learned, both good and bad, uh, through the pandemic. I think speed and regulatory flexibility is really, really important. George referenced earlier on the role of technology. The role of technology is so important, but if it hits a regulatory regime, which is still based on 19th century as opposed to 21st century, that's a challenge. That's number one. Stigma education is, a, is the second thing. We've got, to, we've got to educate both the patient populace, but also governments on this awful disease. And there's the benefit of having um, many years Western experience, we can bring that in, but recognize local idiosyncrasies. Does the WHO have a, a role to play in that? The WHO has a huge role to play mm -hmm. in that. Uh, but the WHO has many priorities. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to work with the WHO, and this is why it plays to the theme of Davos, which is this whole collaborative network. But the third thing is we need sustainable financial investment combined with sustainable human capital on the ground locally. Mm. You can't fly this stuff in. You can't fly this stuff into Botswana. You can't fly this stuff into Vietnam. You have to start building local capacity. And that is the, that is the key, key thing that we're trying to do here at like IQVIA through operating over 120 countries is have that local research capacity built up so that we can do the research and we can keep those sites open for future for future clinical studies as well. I'm gonna take two other lessons from COVID. One, we had to engage low and middle income countries from the beginning, mm. not as an afterthought that or get the largesse of the high income countries. And second, collaboration. Uh, one of the things that really drove faster solutions in the vaccine world was collaboration between governments and industry and researchers uh, and the patient groups. We need to do that as well here. In my view, we ought to be aiming 10 years out for a vaccine for Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease. Mm -hmm. You know, the cost of current medicines now on the pipeline is very high. And it's gonna be very difficult for low and middle income countries to bear the costs of these new medicines. Uh, but we ought to be thinking about what do we do to get to an Alzheimer's vaccine? There are about six of them now in the early stages of development. Hmm. So Where are they being developed? Uh, in Europe and the United States, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and as a consequence, we ought to be thinking, okay, rest mm. of the world, 
get involved in these research efforts and let's now understand what it's going to take in 10 years to get ourselves an Alzheimer's vaccine which is costing under $500, under $300, under $200 because the current medicines are too expensive and too right. difficult to administer. We know how to deal with vaccines. We didn't do a great job in the West in sharing the vaccines with the low and low income countries in COVID. So how do we, we not do that? For Alzheimer's. I mean, one of the big challenges was the supply chains. Um, there was a lot of hoarding. So um, we had a huge healthcare conference in Kenya in December where we had many people from public health, governments, pharmaceutical industry, CDC. And the essence is local supply in Africa for Africa. You know, we, this is why localization is so important. Whilst we operate in a global, globally connected world, we also have to recognize that supply chains research needs to be done increasingly local. It makes economic sense, by the way, but it also means governments can control more of their own agenda. So I think that's one of the, the key areas. I also think that, you know, we, I think the, the whole procurement around vaccines for, for mm. COVID-19 really um, was suboptimal. I think there were a lot of lessons learned there. And I think the WHO has a leading role to play here, taking those lessons learned and moving forward. So I think local lessons from a supply chain perspective, which we're already seeing right now, building up local capacity, but also recognizing we have to get ahead of the next pandemic. We have to get ahead of, um, of the next outbreak, which unfortunately I think will be a question of uh, when, not if. Mm. I would also tell you, strikingly, mortality of Alzheimer's is now greater than COVID, hmm. and it has been consistently through COVID-19 experience. So that in fact, more people are dying now. Around of, the world. Around the world of Alzheimer's. Than hmm. COVID. And so as a consequence, we have to recognize that pandemics can be fast, they can be infectious, mm -hmm. but pandemics can be slow growing. Mm. And we ought to be more aware of the fact that there are slow growing pandemics that we ought to be dealing with, with the same sense of urgency uh, and alleviation of human suffering mm. as we did with COVID and infectious disease. Interesting. So this idea of the clinical trial seems to be kind of central to, to how we can change this because it, it really in, it includes most of the world. So I wonder mm. if that also, besides Alzheimer's, uh, is clinical disease, clinical trials, is that an important s part of the uh, of, of diseases like other non-communicable yeah. diseases, cancer, cardiovascular, mm -hmm. diabetes, other chronic conditions? A hundred percent. And I think the lessons from COVID are we can do things quicker. You know, the, the, the challenge has always been with clinical trials. You want the highest safety, the highest quality, the highest efficacy. Um, but they took a long time. And we saw through COVID, you could create a vaccine, decode the genome, uh, manufacture it within 11 months. And there are, I'm not suggesting you can do that for all disease types, mm -hmm. but that level of urgency and that level of regulatory flexibility, perhaps more of a focus on post-approval safety follow-ups as opposed to having 10 years to create a vaccine or, mm -hmm. a, or a treatment is the way forward. And again, I think regulators through the FDA and the EMA have learned some of these lessons. Clinical trials are central to the advancement of right. treatments. It's absolutely vital, not just from the science, but also getting communities involved, which then helps educate communities. Mm. It's not just a clinical solve we need. We also need a cultural solve. And that's why I think clinical trials are at the forefront of this battle we, fight, we, we face. Alistair mentioned earlier public health issues. Uh, in fact, we ought to deal with this in a public health sense too. There are trials now around the world of lifestyle changes uh, and lifestyle modifications which will reduce the risk of dementia, at the same time reducing the risk of cardiovascular mm -hmm. and diabetic mm. diseases. Uh, so thinking about how to combine uh, a, a lifestyle trial uh, with metformin or other sort of anti-diabetic drugs or mm -hmm. anti-hypertensive anti mm -hmm. drugs is vital. So there are now these studies going on in numbers of countries around the world, mostly in low and middle income mm -hmm. countries, where in fact you get very much more lower cost solutions through a public health lens right. that Alistair mentioned earlier. So it, these, are, these are happening now, but what actually happens in human beings is important. So clinical trials are critical because otherwise it's just solving the problem for mice and rats again. We've <laughs> done that so many times, we need mm -hmm. to solve it for humans. For mice and men and women. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, if we meet again here next year, what do you want the success to, to, to look like? What does success look like in the next 365 days? I will tell you that getting governments engaged is one of the big problems. Mm. We've got industry engaged. We've got researchers engaged. We've got Alistair's company engaged, which is central because they work globally. 
Uh, but what we need is more government involvement. They don't have to be heavy, but they have to be financing the research, and they also have to be financing some of these trials. Uh, and they've got to recognize that the impact on one nation is not enough. They have mm -hmm. to combine their efforts and combine their resources in order to get at this problem. It's not a one country problem, hmm. it's a global problem. What about success for you? Um, same, plus I just think we, there are so many amazing treatments coming into the market in the next three years, curative diseases. Um, we don't lose sight of Alzheimer's yeah. um, because the focus uh, quite rightly is often on oncology, on cancer. Um, the focus is on cardiovascular heart disease. But as George said, it's all interconnected. So I just hope that we don't lose the focus. And then the final thing for me personally on a passionate level is low middle income countries. Mm -hmm. They are so important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because I think from a clinical research perspective, the, the genetic diversity which is required for future trial success is often in low middle income countries. And we need to do a mm -hmm. better job there. Thank you both, Alistair and George, Mitty. for joining us here in the Mitty, Hub Culture. Thank you for having us. Hand thank you very much. Studio, and I am Edie Lodge. Thank you.